All right, good morning, church. Good morning, brother. Good morning. Let's all stand to our feet and worship God this morning. Let's sing out. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people. Sing for joy unto the Lord. Let's sing it again. And clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God. With the voice of triumph, clap your hands, all ye people, sing for joy unto the Lord. We're singing hallelujah, 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 and hallelujah, 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 and Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. Lord of all the earth, Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. So clap your hands, all ye people, let's hear it, shout to God, with the voice of triumph, clap your hands, all ye people, sing for joy. Unto the Lord, let's see those hands. We're singing hallelujah, 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 and hallelujah, hallelujah, and hallelujah, hallelujah. And Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Come on now. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. And watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. And tell the world of his great love. God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise. Let God arise. Who saves? Let him hear it this morning. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise. Let God arise. Who saves? Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Amen. Amen. Y'all 
Everybody can be seated. I say it again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back with you. I uh, missed last week, and uh, Seth stepped in my place and did an awesome job. I want to give him a hand right now for that. Also, want to give a hand for the praise team. They're amazing every week. Give them a hand. Awesome, awesome. We got a special Sunday uh, today, and if you're visiting with us, we want to let you know you're an honored guest, and we're so happy to have you with us. Um, one thing I love about this church, um, besides just loving Jesus so much, is that we put a lot of emphasis into the youth and the teens and that that program, and uh, that that comes from the the top. That comes from the elders. That they, they really invest a lot in that in their hearts and, and and just pouring that into the focus of this church and so we are highlighting our, our senior graduates this uh, this Sunday and we want to congratulate them for their achievements both uh, high school and then we eventually uh, I think we'll do college too next next week so um, yeah just an awesome time to get to celebrate them and what they've accomplished in a great, great group of, of teens. And uh, we wish them the best. So we're doing that uh, today. And uh, we get to have a special co-sermon going on. So you'll see what that is about later on. You'll see the two barstools there. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to do our, our usual little meet and greet, uh, shake and bake, hug, hug and howdy, whatever you want to call it. So go ahead and stand up. And uh, do that now, and then we'll, we'll continue on the worship. No sweeter name 
In the name of Jesus, no sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Jesus, because you are the light to my heart and my soul. And you are the light to the darkness around me. And you are the hope to the hopeless and broken. And you are the only truth and the way. Because you are the light to my heart and my soul. And you are the light to the darkness around me. And you are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. always such a special a special day we actually have a longer slideshow that'll feature more of them we're showing that to them tonight at their special senior dinner and then we're gonna make that available for y'all so you can sit there but I've got to say real quick y'all all need to watch it seniors and parents with uh, Miss Nettie sitting right behind you because 
the affirmation of how beautiful your kids are was amazing the whole time. That was so neat. Uh, what we're going to do now is, is, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through our, our graduating seniors and uh, invite them and their parents to come up here. Uh, you are more than welcome after they, they come up to, to applaud. It's not a hold the applause to the end sort of thing. We definitely want to... Uh, uh, to fill it up and to honor them. Um, so we're just going to launch right into it. So our first senior is Thomas Shields. Thomas is the son of Kelly and Stacey Shields. Brother to Joey Shields. You guys can come right up here on the, on, the, on the floor here. Thomas will graduate from West Florida High School of Advanced Technology with certifications in Photoshop, Dreamweaver, Animate, Premiere Pro, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. He will attend the University of West Florida in the fall with a focus on the College of Business. All right. Our next senior is Rachel Marie Brown. Rachel is the daughter of Ralph and Leah Brown, sister to Kayla and Evan Brown. She graduates uh, magna cum laude with a high honors with a 3.9 GPA from Washington High School, which means this is... Where's the crazy stuff? And she is planning on achieving an associate's degree from the Pensacola State College in Dental Hygiene. All right, our next senior is Natalie Mulder. Natalie is the daughter of Aaron and Beth Mulder and the sister of Becca. Uh, she has her core for capstone, received church scholarships, and is planning on uh, attending UWF with, with a major in psychology, looking to be an occupational therapist who works specifically with children with special needs. Our next senior is Mason Mallory. Mason will be graduating from the Navarre High School. He's the son of Ryan and Jennifer Mallory, the brother of Kendall and Kate Ryan. He was in the top 10% of his class. He lettered in football as part of the NHS, National Honor Society, uh, received a scholarship uh, with his ACT and a presidential grant. He is going to Harding University, where he's going to major in biology with plans to become a pediatric dentist orthodontist. <laughs> Our next senior is Cheyenne Besh. <laughs> Cheyenne's graduating from Anchor Academy. She's the daughter of Mindy Besh and the granddaughter of Peggy Besh. She will graduate with a GPA 3.94. She's going to be going to general studies at UWF while continuing to work as a Navy welfare and recreation aide. And she plans on going to veterinarian school. Our next senior is Sadie Hardy. Sadie. She'll be graduating from Kate High School. She's the daughter of Josh and Holly Hardy, sister of Lily, Gabby, and Lexi, and the granddaughter of David and Tammy Wilson. Oh, yeah, I'm getting there. That was a, a fun laugh there. She'll be going to uh, the uh, USA uh, to work with um, getting her degree in neonatal nursing. She was a member of the Beta Club, National English Honor Society, and was the recipient of the HOSA Award, which is a medical uh, club. So congratulations, Sadie. And our last senior today is Sophie Roy. Sophie is the daughter of Ted and Deanna, but she's here with her mom, Deanna, and her stepfather, Lee Duvall. She is the sister of Dylan and Hunter. She was on the volleyball team, varsity, track. She was a member of the Optimus Club and Best Buddies and NHS, a member of Mu Alpha Theta, which is a math honor society, National English Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society, and is a recipient of the Bright Futures Full Scholarship. She will be attending FSU in the fall and majoring in biology with the goal of becoming a PA. This is a special group of seniors. Um, in fact, I was just showing Jeremy the picture that I took of my very first Wednesday night with Rachel Brown uh, over seven years ago almost, and it's still the picture whenever she texts me once every six months. But no, I'm just joking. Yeah, I kid. I kid. 
Uh, it pops up, and it's so neat to see that. This is such a special group of seniors. We love you guys very, very much. Tonight we'll be honoring them with a special dinner. Uh, I do want to say a prayer over all of you now, and, uh, and we will give you one more round of applause. Let's pray. God, we love you so much, and this is such an important time for everyone who is standing up here's life. It's an important time for the teen. It's an important time for the parents, the grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the friends. Uh, Father, this is that moment. This is that moment where, where a new phase of life begins. But Father, what's so amazing about you and your kingdom and your son is it exists in all seasons of our life. And so even though they enter into a new season, Father, they do not leave your kingdom. They do not leave your presence. They do not leave your love. They do not leave who they were created to be in your name. God, I pray that all the things that, that have been taught to them uh, are things that they can continue to apply. Father, I, help, I hope that they truly know on this day, Father, that this is a, their church home. And so no matter how far they go, Father, they can always come back to open arms and love in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for all of their amazing accomplishments. And it's your, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you, God, so much. You may be seated. Love to see that. As I was uh, picking the, the songs for today, I kind of tried to center it around uh, what what message may be relevant to, to that to that group of, of people, those seniors who are going out and uh, and uh, experiencing more of the world. The world's going to throw at you a lot of different things, and they're going to tell you a lot of different things. They're going to sell you a lot of different things. They're going to tell you you need this or that. Um, and it's all based around one idea, in my opinion, and that's to make you fear. Fear that you're going to be left out or not be good enough or not be up to, to par with everybody else or, or whatever it may be. And so I picked this song, No Longer Slaves, because in the chorus it says, we're no, we're no longer slaves of fear. Amen? Amen. We are a child of God, and you are a child of God. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing this song. We're going to prepare our minds to commune together. I want you to think about that idea. In 2 Timothy, it tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, and love, and self-control. Let's sing now I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. Now I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Now I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. Now I'm no For I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again into a family. Your blood flows through my veins. Now I no longer to fear, for I am a child of God. Now I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God.
God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. holidays that we have kind of thing but one of the big holidays that they have is Memorial Day 
And it's not Memorial Day like we celebrate here for those that served our country, but it's a memorial for, for people and their families that have gone on and have passed away already. And um, uh, her father passed away when she was three years old. And uh, for 36 years now, they have honored uh, their, her father on the, on the same day every year. And uh, I was able to uh, have the privilege of attending one of these services, not, not for her family, but for one of her uh, staff that she had at her, uh, her office. And uh, there was probably 75 to 100 people there, and they came. We ate a lot. We ate a lot. And, uh, and, and I didn't really know what was going on for most of it. <laughs> Uh, not speaking Vietnamese. So, um, but it was really cool to see how all the family came and, and really, uh, really lifted that person up and, and talked about, you know, uh, things that they had had in their life, the experiences they had had. And so I thought that was a really good uh, thing to do, a good example to have. And I noticed that it was really an intimate time for the people that were there. Uh, to come together and share a meal. And so this morning I want to ask all of us, what special memories will come to mind for you as you take the Lord's Supper this morning, remembering the relationship that you have with Jesus? He just says, remember me. So what do you remember about your relationship with Jesus this morning? The body, which was sacrificially given for us, cup, which represents the blood establishing the new covenant poured out for you and me. And hopefully that's the lesson gateway this morning, that we see this time for what it truly is, an intimate time with Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, as we uh, prepare to take this uh, communion together, this supper, uh, Father, I pray that our hearts are focused on on Jesus. I pray that our hearts are focused on the life he lived, the example that he was, the sacrifice uh, not only on the cross, but to leave heaven, come down here, uh, be our Savior. And so, Father, as we take this bread uh, that represents his body, um, whether we picture him in our minds, his face, Maybe some of the acts that he performed while he was here. Uh, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that each one of us would connect. Each one of us would celebrate. Each one of us would honor and remember our Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Father, again, uh, we're going to take this cup, Lord, which represents your blood. And again, all you ask is that we remember you in this. Help us to remember that uh, the, the great cost it was, but also help us to remember the, the benefit that comes from this cup. Father, the cleansing blood removes all of our sin away gives us an opportunity uh, to be connected to you, Lord, in a new way. And so as we take this cup, Lord, I pray that, that uh, we would just remember what's, what's happening at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
beer coming up here. I forgot my little, little supper cup and stuff. So I'll take care of that in a minute. Uh, now we come to the time where uh, we ask uh, that you would consider uh, giving back to the church, uh, giving back to God. Uh, he's given us so much. Uh, yeah, let's pray. Father, again, we're grateful for the opportunity to even come here and worship for this place, this building. We can all come and and uh, and just have have a place uh, to be together as a as a family. And for that, we're grateful, Lord. We look forward to. Uh, how you've provided for us uh, in the near future uh, to have our own own place, uh, our own place that's that's being built in your name. And so, Father, as we consider uh, today uh, uh, what our standing is in your kingdom and our relationship with you, and and Father, uh, we pray that that will motivate us uh, to give in a way that feels good. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to be standing. Love the message of this song, Build Your Kingdom Here. And when I think about here, I don't mean here on this earth, I mean in our hearts. And uh, I pray that that's something that we can all say to, our, to, to God today is to ask him to come into our hearts and uh, build his kingdom there. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives For your our joy and prize To see the captive's hearts released The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace We lay down our lives for heaven's cause We are your church And we pray revive this earth so build your kingdom here and let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand and heal our streets and land. And set your church on fire and win this nation back. And change the atmosphere and build your kingdom. your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop, your beauty changing hearts, you've made us for much more than this, awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ, we are your church. And we are the hope on earth. So build your kingdom here and let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand and heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire and win this nation back and change the Church on fire and win this nation back and 
and change the atmosphere and build your kingdom here. We pray. Amen. Let us see. Well, this year is a little unique in that probably the first graduation appreciation that I've been a part of where I've gotten the privilege of watching a lot of these kids actually grow up through the youth ministry program in high school. And so I found myself getting a little sentimental over there as I watched them uh, be honored. Uh, I remember I have one specific memory um, from year one. Uh, we were invited over to the Shields home uh, when we got here. And at that time, a young Thomas Shields and Joey were around uh, third, fourth grade, something like that. And um, I remember our kids going to the back room and playing and, and Kelly and, and Stacy, myself and Jennifer were just getting to know each other and we were sitting around and we were talking and everything. And Thomas walks into the room and they had been sword fighting with these foam swords. And um, I guess Joey had gotten a little aggressive and he had hit him a little too hard. And Thomas was coming in to tell his dad, but his dad had not responded in the way that he felt he should respond. And so he threw his hands down to his side and he said, he could have killed me. <laughs> and that memory has stuck with me all of these years. He, he was not happy about that moment. So, so watching these these children become young adults has, has been an honor and a privilege that both of us have had. Seth and I will be team teaching today, and, and really, we, you know, Seth could have done it, I could have done it. We both did youth ministry for years, and um, you know, it's one of those deals where we've morphed into a different uh, type of, of leadership in ministry, uh, but it's when we started thinking about the natural flow of a lesson, we both kind of came to a similar place and that was, you know what? We waste a lot of our time on graduation Sundays. <laughs> we, we tell things to the graduation senior, graduating seniors as if that's, this is the one message you need to carry with you the rest of your life. And, and um, after so many years of, of raising our own children and watching you raise yours and experiencing others that have raised theirs, there are just certain things that get said every single graduation Sunday that really probably should go away. It should be more about honoring where these teens are, and we'll get to some of that specifically in a minute, and the spiritual lives that you and we and the Lord Jesus have helped cultivate in them. And today's message is a little bit more than just for them. It is also for you because we adults, listen up, give me your attention. Some of you are already drifting like I graduated years ago. <laughs> you did, you did, but this message is for you. And I'm just forewarning you. It might sting a little. So get ready, get off those hands because there's a message that's coming that is convicting. And it is a message from us to you and we feel from the Holy Spirit that tells us that, number one, adulthood is a lifelong process, right? Yeah. Number two, spiritual maturity takes years and decades. And number three, we don't retire from the kingdom of God. That's right. That's right. We don't quit. Some of us, but we sometimes quit. So I'm going to pass it to Seth for a little bit. Um, Seth brain dumped most of this. We kind of talked and he went around and he sent me an email and it was a lot of this material. And I was like, dude, you should just preach this sermon. And uh, it was so good, but we, bo we both tag teamed on it and began talking about it and commenting on it. And so we're both going to kind of go with this from that angle. Yeah, and one of the reasons we landed on the team teach is because as we were sitting there walking through all of this, you know, we realized that I have 10 years of youth ministry experience specifically. Jeremy has 48 years of youth ministry experience. <laughs> and, you know, when you combine, 
<laughs> well, what was here's what's fascinating. We're sitting there, and we're actually at the place where our work can now be qualified. And what I mean by that is a lot of times in youth ministry, we wonder what's successful. And to a lot of y'all, it's how many people are in the youth group numerically, right? How big is the youth group? That's the number one question that I get from everyone. How big is your youth group? How big is your youth group? And it's so hard to say, what is successful ministry? And I've always said that, well, you'll know if we had some degrees of success after five years after the team graduates. And then we'll know if we had even more success 10 years after they graduate. And then we'll know, y'all with me? I can keep going if I need to explain it, but that's kind of how it is. And then we both sat down and realized, man, we have moments and we have people and senior Sundays and time that we have spent where we can actually say, this is something that all of the people we talk to still remember. And this is something they don't remember at all. And so to qualify some of the things we're going to talk about, while they might not necessarily be the things that we want to talk about on a senior Sunday, they are not bad things. They're good things. They're things that you should have been teaching your teams and we should be teaching everyone in the church throughout their life. But what I found is on you know the youth ministry Facebook pages, senior Sunday's coming up. What are the five things I need to tell my senior? And I'm like, youth minister, if you haven't figured that out for one Sunday, you're missing the entire point of what it is to walk in the name of Jesus with teens, into college, into young adulthood, into the various ages of life. So uh, one of the things, and I meant to say this earlier, and this is kind of an aside, I want to highly uh, recommend everyone afterwards to walk by our tables here where our seniors are have put a few things that kind of show who they are, their identity, the things that, um, uh, that they're very proud of, and, um, and, and make sure that you do that and, and honor them in that way. But while you're doing that, I want you to keep this in your mind. And this is more of our final point, but I, we'll, we'll get there. I want you to think about the ways that you as an adult can learn from teenagers. I want you to think about ways that you as adults, as grown adults set in your ways, as you are, what are some things that I can continue to learn from teenagers? Keep that in your mind as we kind of go through this. You know, one of the things that the Lord Jesus did was, we did a famous passage, he drew the children unto him. You know, he, he kind of encircled himself, encapsulated himself with children, and talked about how, how great their faith was and that we had to have the faith as children. Sometimes we, we grow up and, and big adult problems, big life problems help kind of crush that faith a little bit and we begin to have those doubts and so on and so forth. But Jesus was saying much more than, hey, when life gets hard, don't lose your belief. He was saying, don't lose your innocence. And, and Seth has a comment in these notes um, that I just absolutely loved. And uh, matter of fact, I'm just going to flip to it. Um, you know, we talk about the importance of, of showing our kids excitement. And uh, one of the things he said, which I thought was uh, really good, was he said, um, yeah, kids are a little wild and a little loud, but this is the beauty of sheer joy. In fact, when did we decide that serious was what God wanted? When did we decide that it was time for joy to end so that they could know when it's time and proper to be serious? Maybe the Lord Jesus was saying, hey, listen, you, you stiff-necked people, which he normally called the Pharisees, you need to loosen up a little. You need, to, you need to get back in touch with your, with your young side. So, so there are things, usually on these graduation Sundays, that we think our teens should hear. And we're going to list off five of them right now. The first one is, we think that when a teen graduates, they need to be really good at apologetics. Right? What is apologetics? Well, it's the ability to defend your faith. Teens. You're graduating. Now's the time to have all the answers because you're about to go into a liberal institution taught by liberal teachers and all they're going to do is demolish your faith. And what we teach them is more so about fear and having the right answers, which, newsflash, many of us don't have. Right? 
We want to put place this weight on them that says, hey, listen, you need to get it all together and have all the right answers because somebody's going to come and they're going to question your faith. Typically, though, I have never, I don't know about you, but I've never experienced in youth ministry teens that lost their faith. I deal with adults who are having struggles with their faith. And so why do we feel that apologetics is, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important, but why do we think it is so important to, to place this this impetus on our teens to say, hey, you've got to have all the answers to all life's problems because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to lose your faith. What message are we sending unintentionally? So that's one. Another one is you need to figure it out all real quickly because all of these attacks are coming. What attacks? Well, the news media is going to get to you. Schools are going to get to you. They're going to, be wild. They're going to have wild friends. Listen, I'm, Tyler's in kindergarten. He's got wild friends right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I see some of the way you raise your kids. You know, your kids are wild, right? So we prepare them. We almost send them out into this world where, where we tell them, or we, we set them up, we tee them up for all this stuff that could possibly happen. But chances are, if we're raising them with the proper integrity, um, they're pretty good at standing up for themselves when they need to. Yeah, and, and going off of these two things, think about this. You know, you raise your child to cheer for a certain football team. And a lot of times that child's going to go and they don't need to know all of the championships that, that that team won. They don't need to know all of the things listed out. They don't need to know who the head coach was in 1992, 93, 94. Now, they may know those things, but they don't know them. They just walk out and they exclaim, Roll Tide, War Eagle, you know, uh, all of these, the only two schools that apparently exist when you do a sermon. Um, but, uh, well, one of them. And so a lot of times, and again, remember what I said, apologetics are vastly important, but I find a lot of times right before there's like this panic button where all of a sudden we think that instead of revealing or trusting in what we have taught our teen about the love of Christ, we think that it's about the answers that they're going to have to remember to have immediately, and this is what sustains faith. And then what happens is we swing the pendulum so far that if they happen to meet someone who may be a little smarter than them or a little bit more knowledgeable than them, their house of cards crumbles. What was the foundation of the apologetics? The love of God and being made in the image of God and falling in love with Jesus. That's the foundation. If your foundation is not solid, it does not matter how much facts you know about the Bible. That house of cards can fall. And we put sometimes an unspoken pressure on our seniors. Basically, you can talk to some people and you would think that college is just, I mean, it's, it's the worst place in the entire world that you could send a human. But apparently we have to send you there in some way, shape, or form. And so all of a sudden now they feel this pressure to have it figured out quickly. Church, we don't have it figured out quickly. What we need to provide for them is solid, loving presence through those journeys. I mean, when it comes to apologetics and, and having all the right answers, I have found, uh, 45 years old now, about to be 46, I have found that when it came to having all the answers before, you know, how old is the earth? You know, when did the dinosaurs really, when were they really here? I, I really felt like I should always have a biblical answer for that. And now I'm to the point where I'm like, I don't care. I, like, I love Jesus. I think Jesus's mission on earth is way more valuable than knowing how many thousands or billions of years something's lived here. I just don't care. It doesn't matter to me. And there are certain things about a faith that we have attributed to knowledge that really in the end doesn't matter because it's more about falling in love with Jesus and his way of life and selling out for him than having all the right answers. I'm okay with saying, I don't know. And I'm okay with saying, I don't know, because there are many instances where the Bible says it doesn't know. You understand what I'm saying there? Sometimes the Bible's not clear on certain scientific questions. Guess what? It wasn't meant to be. 
So for us, who, for us, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to drive our kids to having all the right answers. We need to lighten up a bit and, and show them this love affection that we have for Jesus and hope that's contagious because that is what will carry them through. You are not going to educate your kids into knowing Jesus like you think you are. Mm -hmm. But you can educate them into knowing Jesus while loving Jesus so much they see it in your life. This next one is personal. This one stinks me because this one is one that I always think, and I've, I've been guilty of this one too. We think this is the number one question. Again, you, you see it on youth minister forums, which are things that exist. What do you need to tell your senior? Well, you need to find the perfect book. You need to, you need to hand them the book that's going to give them all of the answers. And look, there are seniors, graduated former seniors in this room that I have handed books to. And I'm not, this is not shame. This is truth. They, not one of them read the book I gave them. You, you got one from uh, right, Jennifer right, right there. Right there, right there. <laughs> so, uh, so, so look, I mean that with love. What's, what's my point? If that's not what they're going to connect with, then that's not what we need to, to do. Now, that one, we don't have to spend a lot of time with this one. But again, we think, y'all notice, we're thinking intellectually. We're thinking academically, which are not bad things, but they are not the thing. And no lover of Jesus is going to want to read any book you hand them unless you have already shown the fruit of your love for Jesus in your life. Mm. And let's be honest. If you have ever taught a Bible class where a book was mandatory, hey Seth, how many times have you taught a book class where adults bought those books and they never read those They're books? They're really good at buying them. <laughs> Every time, I, I'm telling you, we'll say, buy this book, you'll buy the book, we'll sell 20 of them, and we'll teach the class and we'll say, how many of you are, uh, read the chapter this week? <laughs> I started it. You don't read books. So why would you hand your kid something you don't even use yourself? What, what is the logic behind that? It makes us feel good, though. Hey, here's a book we think has all the answers. Have you read it? No, not really. I have a book next to my toilet. 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader that was written by John Maxwell that was given to me upon graduation. Guess what? I don't know what the first one is. But I guess it's good toilet reading. Yeah. yeah, our next one, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this one either, but it's that one incredible Sunday sermon where we think that one moment, or, or it could be that one incredible Bible class, that one incredible thing. Again, what we're trying to paint forth this picture of this is a lifelong process. So when your senior graduates, we are not cutting them off from the body of Christ saying, we hope that you got it. Don't forget that last sermon. We are sending them on saying, we're here for you always. We love you in the name of Jesus always. There is no condition by which you are going to go that you cannot come back to us. You might come back to us a little bit broken with some tears. You might come back to us walking with some of the consequences of some actions. But guess what? In the name of Jesus, this body is always going to love you. Mm -hmm. So there's what we've gone through the list now. We're through the negatives about what we think they should hear. But here's what they should actually hear. And the first one is cliche as it comes, so prepare yourself for it. And here it is. It is simply this, fall in love with Jesus more and more. Now, we, call, we say that's cliche, cliche because we always say it's important to fall in love with Jesus. But many of us, sometimes I wonder which Jesus we fell in love with. There are different ones, right? There's most of... Jewish people and early Gentile converts fell in love with the warrior Jesus. The Jesus that was going to show up and show everybody. That's my tough Jesus. And I love that Jesus. But there was the other Jesus that many of us need a healthy dose of. And that is the empathetic and compassionate Jesus. Many of us sometimes have more commentary on what's going on in the world by how jaded we've been in society rather than seeing things through the empathetic and, and compassionate side of Jesus. Jesus shows up at a well. There's a woman who is broken. Jesus kneels beside one who has been shamed and is about to be stoned. And she is absolutely guilty. Both of them are. But in that moment, Jesus doesn't talk about her living off the government. Jesus doesn't talk to her about the fact that she is shamed and should be rightfully so. It's her own fault. 
Jesus doesn't condemn her. He welcomes her. And it's that heart of Jesus that we need to remind ourselves still exists. Falling in love with Jesus, I don't know about, we've talked about it till we're blue in the face, but one of the greatest things about The Chosen, episode five launches tonight. One of the greatest things about The Chosen is seeing the humanity, compassion, and empathy of Jesus revealed on screen. I've seen that in my mind forever, but seeing it tangibly allows me to fall more in love with Jesus again and again and again. Because here is a man who walked the earth who literally had all the answers but didn't spend his time just giving the answers un unless it pertained to what they needed to know at that time. Think about this. When we say fall in love with Jesus, I want you to track through what the life is of a child into graduation and so forth. Who's the first Jesus that our children fall in love with? The one that's proclaimed to them in Bible classes and also represented by the one proclaiming it. They're Bible teachers. That's the first Jesus that some of us, of some of our children encounter, us at our houses. Now, track them through as they continue to grow up. What is the Jesus they're following in love with? Well, I'll tell you, and this is where I'm going to start stinging you a little bit. A lot of us are more interested in what Jesus the youth minister is teaching our teens than being the body of Christ and Jesus they need to know in general. So here's, you would answer the question, what team, what, what Jesus has, have our teens fallen in love with? And a lot of y'all would be like, well, you tell us, youth minister. No, that's one of the areas we've missed as a body of Christ. The, the Jesus that our teens need to fall in love with is the Jesus that we represent every single day. And if you think that teenagers are not watching every aspect of your life, and playfully mocking some of the hypocrisy that they see with their youth minister on Wednesday nights, you are wrong. Because they see it. Because guess what? You are the thing that they are supposed to be ascribing to. You hear that, church? You are the person that they are supposed to want to be in the name of Jesus. When they are getting ready to go to college, they look at you having gone to college or the workforce or in any one of those things. And then they see you as an adult and they think this, is that a Jesus worth following? Mm -hmm. Are they living in a way that is worth emulating? And church, look, I'm just going to be just flat out painfully honest. What if young people are not leaving the church because of Jesus, but a toxic version of Jesus that they can't get behind? What if young people are leaving the church, not because they do not believe in Jesus, but they do not believe that he can transform life the way that we've always told them because they've watched us. So when we say fall in love with Jesus, this is what we're talking about. And now here I would say this, as you get older, the Jesus you fall in love with. When you hit those mid-30s, into your 40s, into your 50s, what if the Jesus you fall in love with at that age is the Jesus the teens are in love with? Where they can walk into a place and a song is sung and they don't care what key it is, they don't care what's happening, they just want to sing. They can walk out into a, a field at camp and connect with God underneath the stars within minutes because their hearts are so in tune. They are curious and passionate about knowing Jesus more and more and more. And they ask great questions. And here you go. They're willing to change their minds. They're willing to grow. They're willing to change. At what point when we became adults did we decide that being like Jesus was complaining about all of the bugs and everything outside as we're worshiping underneath the stars and saying, no, the Jesus I've always known is the Jesus, the only Jesus I care to know. Have we lost the wonder? Have we lost the passion? Have we lost the excitement? Have we lost the joy? I think it's, I think it's cyclical. I think you reach an age where you need to look back at these teenagers and be like, I want some of their Jesus again. Yeah, let's talk about that, because an interesting fact is whenever I was being hired by another church coming from a youth ministry uh, a job, or whenever I was asked to recommend someone uh, for a pulpit preaching job, guess what are the 
prerequisites most of them wanted. Did they do youth ministry? That's what they wanted. Why? Because youth ministries have it all together? No, because they would go to these youth events with their youth ministry and they would experience teaching that they didn't on Sunday and they thought it was deeper than what they originally had on Sunday. And so they were drawn to an excitement. They were drawn to an authenticity. And so I want to point out and brag on our teens for just a bit. Seth wrote out some stuff that was really awesome and I, I had to share it with you because I thought, you know, it's really true. And here it is. It says this. As they get older, they begin to memorize scripture that we tell them to. We don't fully traffic in shame, but we've definitely used some tools to get them into this place. At about this time, when they begin to transition into their preteen years, now the expectations begin to pile on. We expect them to be fun and engaged in worship, but to also be as serious as possible at the drop of a hat. We expect them to behave perfectly at events, even though they cognitively have only been thinking about aspects of those behaviors for a few years. When they don't meet those expectations, we complain about them. But some of the things that we don't talk about about these teens is that in the life of youth ministry, they never stop. They are serving constantly. They are memorizing constantly. They are being challenged constantly. They are together constantly. They are being discipled constantly. They are worshiping constantly. And all the while being judged constantly. <laughs> And sometimes we put these expectations on them that are unfair. We don't put those same expectations on our own spiritual life. Many of us would say we would be exhausted by it. I'm about to embark on mystery road trip. Your payments are due today, by the way. Mystery road trip is, listen, I wake up every morning going, you know what I want to do today? I want a caravan with 37 individuals across multiple states. I am so excited to do this. I want to sleep on the floor for seven days. It's going to be wonderful. And then I get back, and then four days later, we board a flight and fly into one of the most dangerous airports in the entire world. Not because we're being shot at, but because it's, you're landing on a mountain. And then we're there for nine days, eight to nine days. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to take a four-week vacation. I'm kidding. Are you? <laughs> the idea, the idea is that these youth and these adults that are going on this event, these events, are constantly, constantly, constantly engaging with spirituality in some, some form. They are deepening, they are maturing, they are experiencing a lot of times I feel bad because I feel like I feel like when teens leave the youth ministry, what's hard is that they no longer have that type of life available for them. Because as adults, we view that as a season. We need to get back to the point where we challenge ourselves to re-enter that season. When's the last time you went on a mission trip? When was the last time you took up an involvement in ministry? When was the last time you, you held hands with somebody who was hurting and mourned with them and wept with them? When was the last time you interpreted things through a spiritual lens rather than a, a, a lens of anger? These teens are doing that all the time. And you know why? It's not because of them just falling in love with Jesus. It's also because they know they are loved by Jesus. It's the second point. We want them to know today that not only do you, should you fall in love with Jesus, we want you to know that Jesus loves you with every fiber of his being. Go ahead. Our next one, and we're going to move through these a little quicker. Christianity isn't about protecting God. It is about revealing God. This is a truth that, that we want to implore to all of you. A lot of times we begin to think, especially with our teens, that they need to have all of these answers. But what Christianity is, is about revealing Jesus in your life. It is about revealing that we are infinitely loved by God. And then through that love, we then share our love for one another. 
this past Wednesday night, the teens, and to, th to show again what, what Jeremy was talking about, this kind of high-intensity thing, we've been having a Wednesday night Bible class at my house all spring long. We've moved all the way through the entire book of John exegetically at our house. And if y'all like, y'all really use the word exegetical with teens? Yes, because we're, that just means verse by verse. It's not hard. And we're studying it. One of the things we talked about last week was the beauty of the gospel begins with, for God so loved the world. And hanging on to that reality and then working out of that, all of a sudden we realize that Christianity, God is already present. So when you go out into the world, you are revealing God as he is already there. But a lot of times we walk with this armor and we walk around and we walk into spaces where maybe Christianity isn't celebrated or Jesus' presence isn't made known. And instead of us finding ways to love in that place, we just bring that armor and that aggression and that maliciousness. Well, Jesus is not here. You guys are doing this and this and this and this. But what if Christianity is revealing how Jesus is already at work and then having people grow to love who he is through the relationships? Our next one, you are made in the image of God. I cannot stress this enough. You are made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, for he made them male and female. He made them. This is the great truth. Parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, friends, church people. If we are not teaching our members that we are all image bearers of God and that we are all his handiwork created to do good works, shame on us and let's get better at it, church. Mm. Let's get better at it. And then this is our last one on this list, and I love this one. And I'm going to give credit on this one to our very own uh, Elizabeth Tomlinson, who is one of our graduated, former graduated uh, seniors. We sat her down, and we were like, hey, what's important, and would you be willing to get up there and talk? And she said, no. Um, <laughs> but she said, I will share this. I said, what's the one thing? What is the one thing? And she said, healthy relationships with mentors. Healthy relationships with mentors. If you are sitting there asking yourself the question, oh, I wonder who the mentors was. It's supposed to be you, church. It's you. So if you are seeing all of these graduates right now and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I really know them. That's not their fault. They're teens. They got a ton of things going on. When's the last time you said, I want, to, I, want to, I want to meet this teen's parents and I want to walk with them and I want to reveal to them Jesus the way that Jesus was revealed to me. One of the things I've seen at a church that I do love, and if we weren't moving into a new building and spending a bunch of plates at one time, I probably would have tried to create this and I still might try to create it. We'll see. But at a church at the North Boulevard Church uh, where David Skidmore is the youth minister on his senior Sunday, he gets a, a people from the church, not parents, and they basically take a senior graduate underneath their wing and for the entire first year of their freshman year, they mentor them and walk with them and send them encouraging texts, cards, maybe a little money, pay for a meal. Just They just take care of them. I absolutely love it. How many of those relationships do you think just, just die after the first year? Not many. Not many. Because the church said we're going to mentor and walk and disciple with them. And then I say, turn it back. How are we mentoring and discipling each other? How are we walking with each other? If you are feeling the fierce urgency of now in our world, how are you revealing that Jesus to the people around you? I want to read these scriptures, some of these scriptures. We've got a list, so I won't read them all, but some of them over you. And I want you to end this lesson listening to what Christian development looks like. And that is Ephesians 4, 31 through 5, verse 5. It says this, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. 
For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This morning, as we read through these passages, did you have a couple you wanted to read or share? I was going to share the verses for them to, to read. Yeah, go ahead. If you've you gone that. a little long. Um, <laughs> it's typical. Uh, these are the verses I would love for you to read today in the context of what we're talking about. The ones that Jeremy just read. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9. And Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. And the last thing that I want to say is this. I, getting the privilege of working with teens in various capacity, and then also having worked with adults and everything, I want to be like a teen when I grow up. I want to love Jesus the way that they love Jesus. I want to be passionate about Jesus the way that you guys are passionate about Jesus. I want to ask questions like you guys ask questions. I want to be curious, not judgmental. I want to take all of these things. I want to be able to worship at the drop of the hat just because you want to worship. I want to be kind like you are kind. We insist that you guys meet every new person that walks in. We don't even insist that of our adults. We insist that of y'all, and yet you do it with gracious love. Church, yes, it is a journey. But we need to look to our children and our teens to restore joy and passion and wonder in our lives in the name of Jesus. Because they are not perfect, but you aren't either. We are all on this journey together. And that's what's so beautiful about the kingdom of God is, is there is no season that elevates you above anyone else because you can learn from and teach at every season. You can learn from and teach at every season in the kingdom of God. And this is the affirmation I want to speak over these graduating seniors. I am beyond proud of who they are. And I am beyond proud of who they are going to be. And I want them to know that I want to love Jesus the way that they have modeled loving Jesus to me. Congratulations, seniors. I know it's not a traditional invitation, but we traditionally do it. So if there is an opportunity any of you have where you might say, man, I wish we could have some prayer Please come up and allow it to be known uh, to me or Seth as we stand and while we sing. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love. The stair is broken and we have escaped. Blessed be the Lord.
cleaning up, come up here and peruse these tables um, at, on behalf of the seniors. If you want to drop a couple of Benjamins in each basket, they would appreciate that. And so uh, make sure uh, that you uh, honor them properly. Um, also, um, we thought we would have this issue early on when we came here and then COVID erased all that. And now we have the issue. And the issue is our parking lot is full. Awesome, right? It's about time. We've wanted that for a long time and now it's getting full. So here's the deal. If you are capable, we do have some that it requires a lot more energy to walk inside and we want to limit the possibility of, of uh, an unexpected injury here on site. And so if you are able to park in the parking lot that is the far parking lot over here and you're able to walk around, please do so because that will free up some spots. And uh, I realize that's a sacrifice, but um, I, that's where I'm going to start parking. So if you will start parking there, that would be great, especially as we begin to grow back to a larger numbers. So um, I was able to, uh, yesterday, it was really funny, Jennifer and I both, we went to do different things. Um, and uh, I somehow ended up at the new building and then I got a phone call and Jennifer said, what are you doing at the new building? And I was like, why are you creeping on me? And so, uh, so we luckily it was unlocked and uh, Stefan was there and we got to tour it and man, let me tell you, I was there Thursday and it was awesome, but I was there yesterday and the stuff they got done between Thursday and yesterday, we're talking tile work up, we're talking bathrooms almost accomplished, we're talking um, the outdoor canopies, I mean, they worked ridiculously hard for two weeks. The courtyard is being poured this week, so we are so excited. We'll have to do a whole new tour to show you pictures. Kids, your room is amazing, teens and children. Tyler, I'm sorry to say, he was there. He was the first child to break in the new play indoor playground. And he was covered in dust, but it's okay. It was He had a blast, and he wants to go back, and I told him... It, we can't unless you're wearing a hard hat and that's ridiculous in a playground so anyway we'll have another update coming very soon we are really on target for getting this this project accomplished so that we can leave the comfortable cool atmosphere of this auditorium that's a joke and go to a literal colder environment where it's gonna where the air conditioning is gonna be on all the time so um, which elder has to close today is Mr. Ed. Ed's going to come up here and close us out in prayer. If there's any need that you had that we didn't meet this morning, please seek one of us out so we can put that out on the prayer and email or, uh, or let the congregation know what your need is. And until then, we'll see you next week.
a, a unique format in sermon delivery today, but I thought that was great. Seth, Jeremy, never cease to be amazed at the way you delivered the messages. I thought it was spot on, and it was a good lesson. I, I liked it uh, because that, the things you preach to the youth are things that we need to apply as adults. We should never stop learning. I think I've probably learned more in the last 10 years. Uh, one of the things that you touched on that for me, when I think of the word of, of Christ, what is Christ mean? Uh, compassion. Compassion. I think I've, I hopefully have become a more compassionate individual and, and learned to see uh, the world through Jesus' compassion for the people around us. So great lesson. Thank you guys for an absolute awesome job. Let's go to our Father in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. Uh, well, you are an amazing God. You bless us in so many ways. Uh, the world you've created for us, and, and we know that this isn't even anything in comparison to what awaits us in heaven. Uh, you talk about the mansions that you've prepared for us, but we love this world you've blessed us with. Uh, we know that you think about us constantly, uh, strengthen us and nourish us in so many ways, and we're just thankful for that, God. We're thankful for the lessons that have been brought today, and... We want to lift up in particular Cheyenne, Rachel, Sophie, Mason, Sadie, Thomas, and Natalie. And thank you for the blessing that they have been here, Lord. We pray that we've equipped them to go out into the world and uh, that they will take the lessons that they've learned. And uh, Lord, that knowing uh, that they have a family here that they can go back to, that uh, if they do mess up, which we all do, that they have a family to come back to that will strengthen and encourage them and we just we pray lord that they take that lesson with them and more than anything uh, that they don't worry about having the right answers uh, but that they show christ's compassion through what they do and i believe they will do that lord we just we just pray your blessing on them to strengthen them uh, that they seek mentors as they go into new uh, communities to strengthen them and continue to grow and that they be mentors to uh, those that are younger and, and maybe less knowledgeable than they are uh, as they share the word of God with others around them and just show your love for the world. We just thank you, Lord, for so many ways that you bless us. We ask your strength and wisdom as we go into this coming week uh, that we can show your love, show your compassion, uh, show your word in the lives that we live. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.